Hi, everyone. Welcome to our last, our final session for our event. Um, before we move into this discussion, I want to particularly thank Amina Tawasil, Michael Scroggins, if he's still here, Michael, um, Polly Cancro, and all of the hardworking students who helped pull this together. We very much appreciate your work. Also, obviously, want to thank all of our alumni who travel back to campus to be here with us for this event, and each of you for being here as well. The presenters, the audience, um, we've really appreciated your time and attention. So our final session, then, is titled Open Roads, Renewed Possibilities. Our first speaker is Professor Jill Koyama. She's at the University of Arizona in the College of Education, and the title of her talk is when things come undone, disrupting and dissembling an ESL program. Welcome, Professor Koyama. Thank you. So anthropology uh, has long concerned itself with how things come together, uh, how they are constructed, maintained, ritualized, institutionalized, and interpreted by humans. So we have kinship, we have religion, we have structures. I thought you weren't going to do that. <laughs> We're the ethnographers. We take the pictures. OK. <laughs> I don't know about this guy, interloper. OK. Uh, <clears throat> and in this conference, uh, we have even, and I believe it's rightly so, been so preoccupied with how anthropology and education has come together and maintained together, and what the elements are that, uh, to borrow a Varenism that I'm happy to have, in some sort of way, hold together to make it some sort of thing. Uh, I consider myself an anthropologist I, who studies issues of education. I don't say I'm an educational anthropologist, and I don't call myself an educational ethnographer. Uh, it's a choice that I've made. I think it's the right choice for me, and uh, my commitment is to the discipline of anthropology. And I will restate the unpopular thing I restated earlier to be doubly unpopular. I do not feel that anthropology needs to be in the service of education. I think we need to collaborate. I think we need to integrate. I think we need to critically inform it. Woohoo! But I do not, I, I just, I don't like to be subsumed by it. And it, I'm very stubborn on that. Okay. Um, so I study policy, uh, social policy in action, very broadly in the Jean Anion sense. Uh, just pay a little due to her right now. So labor laws, immigration laws, uh, housing segregation, all those things that affect schooling and education. And then I also study policy exclusively associated with schooling, like uh, No Child Left Behind, Race to the Top. I'm kind of dabbling a little bit in Common Core. We'll see. Um, and I study in a way that has been called uh, several different things by very renowned scholars. So appropriation by Levinson, enactment, entanglement. I tend to use uh, actor network theory. Uh, following Bruno Latour, but made most salient for education by Tara Fenwick. So if you haven't read her work, I, I suggest it. And essentially, in a very short amount of time here, Actor Network is essentially how disparate people, the material objects that they create and destroy, and discourses all get brought together to do something. All right? It's a controversial, sometimes controversial, perspective because in this theory, things with human subjectivity have agency. Okay? And if you doubt it, uh, Leslie Bartlett gave me a good argument for it the other day. Think about your iPhones, right? This is a material object, and see how it structures your life. Okay? So this is, this is what I do. Um, increasingly, I, I've just become very interested, and it's where my thinking is today, uh, to a bit of an obsessive place uh, with how, not how things come together, but with how they're always falling apart. Um, and actually how chaotically lovely that can be and necessary and productive. Um, so today when <laughs> Dr. Erickson said, like, turn the sock inside out, I was like, oh, why didn't I think of that? Then my ego went back and I went, I'm going to cite him. So this is the idea, right? It's the same thing that Varenne and McDermott did when they turned the idea of why do so many kids fail into why do we create so many conditions in which they can fail. So it is turning the sock out. 
I'm interested in things falling apart for their own sake. So when I've mentioned this to friends about the falling apart, they always go, oh yes, of course, because then there's new openings, new alternatives, and new things can happen. And I immediately get disgruntled and say, no, I'm just interested in the falling apart as it is. I'm not interested in that it creates these new opportunities, right? Because then once again, it's not about the falling apart. I'm not interested in it as part of a binary, like success, failure, making, unmaking, ill, well. I'm interested in it because it is everywhere. Things are always falling apart, especially in education. And, and I'm okay with that. So uh, I want to talk to you very briefly about a, a study that I've conducted that is one example of this. So um, you're going to have to just accept or challenge me later that it's ethnographic. It's a two-year study of refugees and newcomer networks in upstate New York. Um, and as part of a network, when you're tracing a network, you're following people and you're looking at interactions. So it's the interactions that are the unit of study, and they come together in certain places. And one of the places that they came together was a school uh, where most of the refugees went. Uh, this school was seen under No Child Left Behind as failing. It was a persistently low achieving school. It was a school under review. So it basically had all the titles of a failing school. And yet, it had all these great things going on in more than 34 languages spoken. Uh, they had adopted a wonderful uh, curriculum designed specifically to help these emergent bilinguals, uh, and also some cultural programs, and were working with community leaders and the parents, and so a lot of great stuff was going on. Uh, but because of their status as failing, they had to have a turnaround plan. And the turnaround plan was made by the district. And when it was rolled out, and we all saw it, it had no provision for these English language learners. You guys are supposed to gasp. <gasps> ah, horror. OK. So, ah, kill me. Uh, uh. <laughs> it's getting late. Um, so this happens all the time. This is falling apart, right? So the, what the teachers did, um, maybe I'm interested in falling apart because I'm always having meltdowns. Uh, teachers created their own curriculum, but they pretended to be doing the regular curriculum, and they would open the textbook, and they would have their dibbles, and they would do all these things. But they created their own, and then they created an online version of it so they could share it. So they were always sharing it and had complete feedback on it, and they created logs online to say how certain lessons worked. It was really very organized, right? Uh, an advocacy group formed with local resettlement agencies and literacy volunteers, and they started petitioning the school board meetings and hanging out at the mayor's house to try and get this turnaround plan changed. Um, and then there was, they decided they needed to do more, so they made a concerted effort, and they actually moved, got the parents of the refugees of 20 families to move them out of the school. And then a charter school sprung up less than a half a mile away. So all these things started going on. Um, the point of telling you this, this is basically really falling apart. And from a maybe a more normative discussion, it would be like, oh my gosh, how did this happen? How could they do this? This isn't following policy. This is not being compliant. This is dissensus, this, right? All of this is going on and, oh, this is horrible. What can we do? Shall we sanction them? But to me, I was like, oh, great, look at this is going on. Because out of that, the students started doing better. And their achievements started going up, which I don't really give a sh sh that little kid gone? shit about that. But, but they started going up. So even the traditional measures, right, started looking better. But still, everyone was upset in the district that, that this was going on. So these are the kinds of things that I'm interested in. And, but I know I need to make it relevant for this conference, because that's why I was invited. And this is, by the way, the only time I've invited to speak at a chapel. And trust me, this will be the only time I will be invited to speak at a chapel. <laughs> for those of you who know me, oh, <laughs> if there is someone up there, man, is he having heartburn now. OK. So um, <clears throat> Joe Koyama at a podium in a chapel. Um, so here's what I think is relevant for this conference. Um, this study brings to the fore really actors that are difficult to locate in education, but we know they're there, right? Whether they're test companies, textbook makers, business people who are funding buildings for charter schools, whether they are elected politicians, in this case, the refugee agencies and the pro-charter business people who were going to fund the charters merge together for this picketing, right? So you get these very odd bedfellows that you know, in any other setting, would be happy to ignore each other, right? 
Secondly, I think it, it reveals and acknowledges something that we might add to education, that it's really okay when things fall apart. It is really okay, because it happens all the time, and we need to quit pretending that it doesn't. And we need to quit pretending that schooling is, uh, even as much as we centralize it, that it's a very local process, and it's a very contextualized process, and that anthropologists can add a great deal to that. And in some way, I would like us to get in the conversation, but here's why I think that we are not, and this gets us back to the comments made this morning uh, when Peter and Kathleen, and they were talking about self-censoring. And in some way, we have ourselves to blame for not being invited to the tables in educational decision making. One thing we can't do much about, ethnography takes a long time when done well. We can't do anything about that, so that one we keep. Second is institutional tenure process. We are rewarded for putting our work in the highest possible journal we can. For those of you who are in the process of this or who have done this or who almost have died during this process, <laughs> the higher the journal, the longer the time, the clock is ticking, right? We are not encouraged or rewarded for blogging, for having our own websites, for writing newsletters, newspapers, writing uh, board letters. We are not rewarded for being board members. In fact, we come even, become even more suspicious, right? Once you get tenure, like Varen, and well, students note this. So when, when you're his student, he's Dr. Varen, and then if you get to be his colleague, then he's Hervé. But when you're kind of in that middle oil state, then he's just Varen. So when Varen, <laughs> that, was, that was my mentoring piece. Uh, so Varen is able to do this, and he writes blogs, and I don't know how you do all of those. He's writing blogs, and he's putting pieces. That's important, but we all need to do that. We need to get our voices out there, right? We need to be writing the New York Times. We need to write the Post. We need to be on NPR. We need to be in The Onion. I, we, we need to be in places, right? We need to put our voices out there. We need to be able to write like that. So when they were talking about translation and stuff today, yeah, we can write a certain way for each other because then aren't we such smart people and important people and write wonderful things and cite each other and that's lovely. And then we check ourselves on Google all the time, great. But, <laughs> or if Peter does that, I would do that. But then, <laughs> but then, but then we also need to write in places that are relevant for practitioners. Right? How can we expect them to listen to us when we don't meet them where they are? And I'm not talking about dumbing down language. I'm talking about in the literal places where they are and the things they read. Teacher ed newsletters, principal newsletters, go to associations, become a member, and go. Not to criticize them. They're criticizing themselves too, but to share. Um, and then finally, something else that's probably not gonna be popular, but that's okay, I'm gonna go back to Tucson when I'm done here is um, political correctness. So because we have become the keepers of culture and uh, the knowers of culture, and we've become very politically correct. And one way that that doesn't work for us is we barely talk about race. We barely talk about class. Uh, today there's a courageous student that, that, that brought this up. We don't talk about our own institutions and the marginalization that goes on. I think we need to do that. Right? We, we need to be, in, in my world, we need to be a bit bolder. Okay, not recklessly bold. We need to be informed. We need, our, our scholarship needs to inform the kinds of things we say, but then let's be bold about it. So I went back and looked at some things I have written, the couple of pieces I have written, and, and earlier on I would say things, this could possibly maybe be in some sort of way, blah, blah, blah. What does that mean? I, if I read that, I'd be like, whoa, she's not too sure. Right? And then as it went on, I got a little better. One possible implication might be blah, blah, blah. And I thought, okay, that's getting a little better. And then I read my last piece, and I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to get jailed. Like, it, but I think we need to be bold. So what I've decided with this obsession about falling apart, I'm totally fine if my body of work falls apart. I am fine if the reputation I have falls apart if the consequence is that, is that I be a little more bold, I enter some more conversation, and I say what I think. And if I'm wrong, okay, so what? You know what? So what? I don't do it out of malice, I don't do it recklessly, but I want my voice heard. So if I want my voice heard, I better put it out there, and if I'm wrong, then I do a mea culpa, and like in half a year, if I don't have any naked pictures involved on it, people are gonna forget. 
and I'm going to get a new job, right? You know what I'm talking, you know? That's what, hopefully there are no naked pictures out there. But, but this idea, right, that we can't make mistakes, that we're very tentative, that we have to, to censor ourselves to the place that we allow fear to dictate where we are, right? So I personally, you all hear it here, and uh, it's being recorded because I signed a consent. So you all hear it here. So that, that's what I'm going to try and do. And I'll tell you, I'm not tenured. So uh, maybe it's a bit of a risk, but at the same time, I believe that the people that I work with and the students that I work with will respect me all the more for doing that and that maybe we can start edging our way into conversations. Thank you. Next speaker is Professor Fida Adeli. She's at Georgetown University, recently tenured. She is going to put an interesting spin on this, bringing a comparative lens to our discussion today. The title of her talk is Anthropology and Education in the Arab World. So anthropology and education in the Arab world. Well, there's very little anthropology and education in the Arab world. <laughs> and that's sort of the beginning point. And I, and I kind of took the, the theme of the conference quite literally. And I said, OK, well, let me begin by finding out if there's any anthropology in schools of education in the Arab world. And I did this quick survey and was finding very little, but decided to go ahead with that theme anyway. So let me just say that I did a quick survey about 14 universities in several countries. And I really just went to websites and tried to find out was there anything in schools of education that might resemble what, what we think of as anthropology? And, um, and there wasn't. Um, well, first of all, there are very few anthropology departments, period, in the region. Um, Alexandria University has one of the oldest anthropology departments in the region. It still does. I think they, they have the only PhD in anthropology. And I should give one caveat, which I don't read French, so that meant a lot, a lot of the materials about North Africa were inaccessible to me and a lot of the information. So my small sample is, is sort of doubly biased towards non-Francophone non Arab countries. Um, interestingly, you know, the two American universities in the region, American University of Beirut, American University of Cairo, both have anthropology programs, um, bachelor's and, ma and uh, master's programs at AUB, American University of Beirut. Um, and then I did a little bit of research, just sort of historically, to see um, is there sort of a longer history of anthropology. Again, a Alexandria sort of University comes up as the place in which anthropology is being done. And there were a couple of prominent American anthropologists who went there and helped set up um, the, I think it was, was it Boaz? I, I'm not sure who it was, but someone went out um, to Alexandria and helped start the program there. And um, more recently, I read a little bit about applied anthropology in Egypt. And so there are many, in Egypt, there are actually a number of Egyptians trained in anthropology abroad who are working in Egypt as sort of more applied anthropologists in fields of development, um, often working on state and international development, um, social reform kind of projects. Schools of education generally in the region are organized around what we would consider the more traditional departments in schools of ed, curriculum, teaching, PE, math, science. Um, the, the few interesting exceptions to that is that King Saud University in Saudi Arabia has a master's in the origins of education. And I found on their website the only evidence of a course in anthropology of education at the King Saud University. So I don't know what the substance of that course is. I don't know how often it gets taught. But in that master's program, there was a course in anthropology of education, in the origin, origins of the philosophy of education, and society in education. Um, <clears throat> Alexandria University also has a program in the sociology and philosophy of education and a program in comparative education. AUC, the American University of Cairo, has an MA in international and comparative ed. So, I mean, this just gives you a general sense. So basically, within schools of education, there's occasionally a course on the social context of education. There's that one anthropology of education in the Arab world. So then I decided that I should look and see what um, scholars faculty, researchers in education were writing. And, and this is interesting because many of the academics in the Arab world are trained in the West. And for example, in Jordan, where I do a lot of my research, a lot of the faculty in education have gotten their degrees from the United States. So I did a quick look at um, this database, the Arab Education Information Network, a database of all materials produced about education in the Arab world, um, in Arabic, French, and English. Uh, and they gather all the materials since 2007. So it's not a very deep sample. But I, I looked up 
and only found one um, entry that had any reference to anthropology in it um, in this database uh, as compared to 35 for sociology. I found 52 um, publications that had the word culture in the title. And I did a quick review of, of how sort of culture was being used in those titles. And they said it was usually in, in the sense of sort of the culture of an institution. So the culture of military schools in Jordan and their impact on student performance. Or um, do staff developers in Egypt promote a culture of communication? So you know, I didn't have enough time to really dig deeper into each of these sources and understand kind of what was being done there. But methodologically, um, most of these studies we're relying on quanti quantitative, quantitative methods, um, with very few exceptions. I did a very in-depth kind of look at Jordanian publications. So there were five education journals produced by universities in Jordan. And I looked at about 50 articles just to get a sense. And I would say 95, 98% rely on quantitative data. And not that we don't use quanti we can't use quantitative data in anthropology, but these I'm sort of using the method as a marker, as an index for what might be anthropology or not in that context. And, and I, didn't, I didn't really find anything. The kinds of subjects that were being studied in these articles, some in English and some in Arabic, did things like, looked at things like effectiveness, performance, achievement, attitudes, and primarily were based on tests, um, surveys, and questionnaires. And there were only two authors out of these 50 that I reviewed that talked about using interviews or any kind of interviewing, I mean, any kind of observation. So this just, again, I'm using these kind of methods as a proxy, which is somewhat problematic, but just to try to get a sense of what kind of research is being done by Jordanian scholars. When you look at the research that's being published, and I did even a more preliminary, an even more preliminary look at what's being published in journals in the US through like a database searches. And I took a very, very quick look at about 100 entries, right? And um, that are published in journals in the United States about education and found a bit more by way of interviewing, but very few. So, and again, on Jordan, using Jordan as kind of a case to look more deeply at examples. And um, <clears throat> uh, predominance, again, of quantitative analysis, a few more kind of ethnographic approaches to things. I should say, in all my looking around, the one sort of interesting example that I could think of, and this I sort of knew of in the back of my head, of kind of anthropological work and collaboration amongst educators in the region, was a, a project that Linda Herrera, a graduate of TC, undertook. And I never, I, I, I know her a little bit, but I never talked to her about this particular project, but she published a book out of it. It was a project in which, that was funded by the Population Council in Cairo, in which she and Carlos Torres um, organized this group, Culture and Education Working Group. And they trained education, educators and educational researchers in Egypt to do critical ethnography in schools. And they produced this short volume about that process. And I was thinking that this is sort of an interesting example uh, to consider for future work, um, future anthropological work or collaboration with educators if we think that's a good thing. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, so, <clears throat> so basically, there's a virtual absence of anthropology in schools of ed, anthropological approaches or methods being used by educational researchers in the, in the region. And there's an absent, a, a, a real absence of anthropology period in the region, so being produced locally in the region. It's not, not a total absence. And there are many scholars from the region coming to the United States, going to Europe, and being trained as anthropologists. But there are hardly, you know, there are, I found these two or three departments. There may be something that I've missed in anthropology, but they just aren't anthropology departments. There may be anthropologists of living in sociology departments. And there's some reasons for this. I mean, there's. Anthropology's got sort of a lot of baggage in, in the Arab world, and particularly in North Africa. It's still sort of seen as aligned with colonial experience. And in that sense, um, there's, there may be some interesting kind of anthropological work going on in North Africa, but they probably don't call it anthropology, <laughs> is, is my guess. Um, there's a text in French, unfortunately, and, I, and unfortunately I don't read it, that was just written by a um, French sociologist in Algeria comparing Geert's and Gellner's approaches to studying Morocco was just published recently. So there are folks thinking about anthropology in the region and writing about it. And he's actually going to be a visiting scholar at, at um, Alge uh, Algeria, Georgetown this year. Um, he hasn't come yet. So to come back to this question of sort of what, well, the question I sort of started with, because I sort of guessed going into this that there wasn't much anthropology in the region, even though I went through the trouble to actually prove, try and prove that guess to myself. Um, 
is what might anthropology provide theoretically and practically for thinking about education. And I, I um, Leslie Bartlett in her concept note for this conference, conference sort of lays out the core question that I've been thinking about, right? So how can eth ethnographers acknowledge essential lessons from the postmodern critique of ethnography, I'm quoting her, regarding researcher subjectivity, positionality, reflexivity, while still maintaining the legitimacy necessary to present authoritative policy relevant research findings. And with respect to the Arabic, the Arab world, this question is, is, is quite relevant for those like myself, trained here, who have some connection to the region and doing research there, because we're always being called upon to say something relevant um, about the status of education in the Arab world. And this is kind of the, the uh, overall kind of struggle of anthropology, right? And now in my post-tenure status, I should be able to um, so I waited till tenure, right? To think, I mean, I, the way I've been thinking about my post-tenure status is in what ways can I engage differently that would be useful and meaningful. But, but part, of, part of my concern, though, is, is that that kind of practical engagement can be quite coercive as well in the, in the context of sort of the political realities in the, in the region and the relationship of our, of our government to countries in the region. So it makes it uh, a kind of doubly difficult enterprise. Um, so, and in the, because of that, I think many of us anthropologists who study the Arab world have avoided, avoided these kinds of questions. Um, content, and we've been content to take up issues that have long been the focus of research about Arabs. So issues about women, about the veil, about the growth of religious movements, why do people participate in these movements, and similar preoccupations. And those who have taken up the question of kind of broadly speaking pedagogical processes in the region have overwhelmingly been concerned with issues of citizenship to a lesser degree, but more so kind of gendered and religious subjectivities. My work being kind of the epitome of this. So my own work kind of fitting into this. And this is important work, and it's work that is very much motiv motivated by the desire to speak back to narratives that have really worked to kind of dehumanize people in the region. Um, and it's interesting because yesterday in Shanila's talk about love in Shala, she talked about what might be motivating these women who are kind of testifying about their romantic love affairs and, and this trying to speak back to a narrative of victimhood. But I think those of us writing about the region are often kind of motivated by similar intentions, for good or for bad. Um, so there's much more work that can be done, and so I was just trying to think about what, what can anthropology bring to thinking about education in the region. I mean, there's a real absence of study of formal education in the region, and, and I feel kind of ambiguous about what to say about that, because I feel like a lot of what we've learned as, a, as anthropologists is that, you know, every, education is sort of everywhere, and we should be looking in the informal spaces. And even in my own school-based work, what I found most interesting and fascinating was the sort of informal education going on in school. But, and again, I'm kind of ambivalent about this, mostly just after hearing all the interesting papers here yesterday. Um, but I, what I wrote down is I think that there's re room for engagement in more formal, um, kind of anthropological research about the formal, formal educational context. And, <clears throat> One reason why I think there needs to be more engagement by anthropologists is because in my role as someone who has done some research on education in the Arab world, I'm often asked to review papers by folks in education writing about the Arab world. And I am troubled by um, how little people really know about the context that they're writing about. And I get emails from someone says, I'm writing a book about education in the Arab world. Can you give me the list of three or four schools that I could see while I'm there in July? And, and so I'm really troubled by, and so I often get these pieces that are really decontextualized, lacking any knowledge of history, politics, structure. And so there is writing about the Arab world in schools of education, but I'm a bit concerned about some of that writing, is I guess what I'm trying to say. And so in that sense, I think, anthropology and the kind of training that we hope anthropologists get is, in, is very useful and important. Um, and, I, and I think I should also add that being a so-called native doesn't necessarily exclude you from making these, 
from this, because oftentimes people from the region or people whose parents are from the region, like myself, assume we know things about the region. And, um, and we are, just having grown up somewhere doesn't mean that we entirely understand it. So just because something is written by someone from the region also doesn't necessarily guarantee that they know that history, know that context. They may, and they have insights that others may not. But, um, and I say this only because, again, I'm kind of basing this on my own experiences, reviewing work, reading dissertations, et cetera. One area that's really ripe also for anthropological intervention, I think, is kind of this question of inequality. And initially, I had thought of organizing this whole discussion about this. I don't think there's enough attention to inequality in education in the Arab world, an inequality period. Much of the research and policy discourse about education in the Arab region is framed in terms of skills mismatch. Every time you read about education, the problem of education and youth in the region, it's skills mismatch. And skills mismatch is basically the idea that the reason why you have youth unemployment, the reason why you have um, the youth bomb, this potential explosion of the youth bomb is they're getting irrelevant education, and so they're unable to establish themselves and, and establish a lives for themselves. And, and this persistent characterization of kind of failed education is tied to this, oh, and it's because of rote learning. So we have these images of young people studying Quran. And it's not to say that education is all wonderful in the Arab world, but there are very few people who actually conduct research in schools. But yet we have this sort of image, rote learning, skills mismatch, youth explosion. And this just gets reproduced over and over and over again. Um, I would say the one exception, and so, and there's really just very rich work on inequality and power that's come out of ethnography of education in the, in the, in the US and in Europe that I think would just be extremely powerful for thinking about issues in the region. I would say one exception is that there are a group of economists in Egypt who have been doing really interesting quantitative work, looking at um, patterns of inequality and sort of trying to type different tie different types of schooling to different job prospects, et cetera. But this has its limits. And this is, again, where anthropology kind of can, can play an important role. It has its limits because it can't really go, sort of go deep enough to understand, to understand the perspectives of young people, their own desires, their own perceptions of what opportunities are. And they're also very much driven by a very narrow kind of sense of economic returns to education and not really thinking about what other, why people might want to, might desire education for other reasons. And um, I think more, more research that really takes the perspective of young people is critical. I don't I mean, we talk about Arab youth all the time, Arab youth, Arab youth. I just read three edited volumes for this essay that I'm doing about Arab youth. And, the way in which this term gets used over and over without any kind of like breaking down of that category. And even when people break it down to one country, there's no real sort of breaking down of it. So I think, again, this is a place where anthropology can intervene. This sort of, what is the experience of particular youth in particular contexts, particular histories? And how does this, you know, explain their, how does this explain their relationship to education, their desires for education, their potential pathways? But it also demands that we pay attention to the structures and possibilities that certain youth mean, certain youth um, have face obstacles that they face. So the, along the lines of what Jill was saying about class, race, hierarchies, there's a plethora of research about religious identities and religious pedagogies. And again, my work does that too. There's a plethora of work about pedagogical processes in religious contexts, but that doesn't completely define people in the region. And I think that's one of the weaknesses of the work of anthropologists in the region. As those have been easier spaces in which to work, more interesting spaces, and we've been concerned about those spaces because, again, sort of speaking back and trying to inform an obsession with religion in the region. Um, but there are, other, there are other factors, other histories that shape people's lives, and I think that's an important gap that we could um, contribute to. Um, I guess uh, the only other thing I would say is that um, engaging with researchers in the region and educators in the region, I think, is also something important but quite challenging, again, because anthropology as such doesn't exist. So that's one of the areas um, that I think is quite important. And in my own work, actually, my new upcoming project that I'm trying to develop with some colleagues is this longitudinal study based on kind of following a group of youth in three different countries, working with universities in each of those countries and graduate students in each of those countries that follow a group of young folks from the moment they start a post-secondary institution 10 years down the line. But we're not just interested in kind of the educational experience and the transition to work, 
but sort of family making projects. And I think about Eva's paper yesterday on Liberia, family making projects, migration, all the, all the kind of potential opportunities and obstacles they might face, all the potential pathways they might take. We're planning to interview families. It's a massive project, which in our heads is a massive project. We still don't have funding and we don't, we still haven't, we've partnered with one university so far. So for me, this kind of represents an attempt to do some of this. So I guess I'll just conclude, because I said I wasn't going to take that long, and I'm taking a long time, by saying that I, I was really inspired by just listening to folks yesterday. Um, recently, a friend of mine, you know, there's been this push for all of us to talk about our outcomes from our teaching at universities, learning outcomes and learning objectives. And I was speaking to a friend of mine who was quite frustrated, and she said, I just want them to think that people are human beings in the Arab world. Like, that's my major outcome. <laughs> And honestly, the bar is that low sometimes for us who are working on the region. I, I would say that I have the kind of luxury of teaching in a master's program with folks who have spent lots of time in the region. And in my teaching, that's not really my bar. But in many contexts, that's what it is. I just want to teach my students that people in the region are human beings. But yesterday, I think it was Ed Gordon who said, right, that, that anthropology's greatest contribution has been you know, understanding, helping others understand the lived experience of others. And I think that's still the core of what we can contribute. Um, or the idea that Fred said yesterday, that everyone is making sense. Yes, these young people are trying to make sense of what's been given to them and what's possible. And, and I think in that sense, anthropology is critical. So I will leave it at that, and I will uh, look forward to discussing with you. Thank you. Our third speaker today, we're very lucky to have with us from Temple University, Professor Inmaculada Garcia Sanchez. She's representing a larger group who've been working on uh, these ideas about the intersection of language socialization research and the anthropology of education. That group includes Patricia Baquedano Lopez, Catherine Howard, Leslie Moore, and Laura Sterponi. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. And um, as uh, Leslie just said, I am just uh, one very small head there among a group of very big and smart heads that we've been working on these ideas together. So language socialization researchers and educational anthropologists employ ethnographic inquiry to study participation outcomes of learning processes in educational institutions. Language socialization researchers include linguistic discursive analysis of video and audio recordings of face-to-face -face interaction in order to examine how those engaged in learning activity summon the assistance of others or engage semiotic means to mark their involvement with others in concerted social action. We analyze how cultural and linguistic knowledge is taught, con contested, transformed in moment-to-moment -moment interaction. We understand that these interactions um, to be always contingent on and constitutive of expectations about class, ability, race, ethnicity, and gender. We enter this dialogue drawing uh, on our own individual empirical research at the intersection of language socialization and the anthropology of education to discuss how ethnographic inquiry and discourse analysis make visible the agentive and innovative character of children's interactions in complex learning situations. Our goal is to explore the close relationship between language socialization researchers and educational anthropologists and the shared concern with equitable learning context. We examined um, three intersections where this relationship is articulated. The first intersection is home, school, community, discontinuities, continuities. Um, language socialization researchers have examined this topic uh, with respect to discontinuities in communicative patterns. Language socialization researchers have also examined cognitive and learning styles, the values and identities associated with particular ways of learning and knowing, also identified and shared in classic studies of the anthropology of education. In particular, the work on homeschool discontinuities have offered explanations for the disproportionate school failure of ethnic and racial minority students and argued for improved learning conditions. Learning, uh, language socialization research offers fine-grained analysis of children's participation in the educational context of their lives and how these contexts are both structured and negotiated in the moment. For instance, in her research in Northern Cameroon, Leslie Moore re-examined and expanded on the concept on homeschool discontinuity by documenting and comparing language and literacy socialization practices at home and two different kinds of schooling. 
She studied Fulbright children's socialization in three languages across public school done in French, Quranic school, and domestic activity setting where rote learning was the dominant mode of teaching and learning. On the basis of this work, she developed and modeled the concept of guided repetition, reframing rote learning as a complex and context-sensitive practice for teaching and learning that entails much more agency on the part of the novice that has been recognized in most educational research. The guided repetition model can be used as an edit grid to identify patterns in participants' behaviors in road learning activities, relate these patterns to participation goals, ex expectations, values, and ideologies, track learners' linguistic and social development, and recognize and understand variation over time and across setting and communities in how these activities are organized. This, pers this perspective helped her understand the significance of road learning in this community, its staying power in the face of reform effort and low educational yields and its diffusion across and beyond the two types of schooling. Much like work in the anthropology of education, Ellis' work now recognizes that, that children take a much more active role in their own positioning within dimensions of difference. One example of, um, the, of um, this uh, growing body, um, there is a growing body of language socialization research that examines how children use their language resources to establish and maintain particular social relationships, illuminating how they, are act they actively establish their place in complex social landscapes by aligning on, or not aligning, aligning to role, statuses, and relationships. Like the work in the anthropology of education, language socialization scholars recognize that those who are disenfranchised by societal hierarchies among languages and groups may face limited means of preserving their, their dignity so, through educational engagement. That, that is, they may face an emotionally wrought choice between buying into the subject positions and identities offered to them or dropping out of the status quo through resistance uh, to the, or the pursuit or, of alternative identity. LS researchers have worked to articulate a concern for how members of a community uh, themselves construct notions of difference and how these discursive constructions at varying levels of scale impact children's experiences at the local level, in the classroom, and other educational activities. For instance, in some of my work, um, I've shown how teachers uh, play on essentialist notion of Moroccan immigrant children and Roma minority children's ethno-linguistic identities, upholding notions of social political belonging that are predicated on ideologies of homogeneity and monolingualism. Crucially, however, this research has also emphasized how Moroccan immigrant and, and gypsy children contest teachers' essentialist formulation by asserting multiple hybrid forms of membership and belonging. Um, a great deal of language, uh, well, also, rather than, um, in, in this direction, rather than taking dimensions of difference um, as a given, this kind of work is concerned uh, with understanding how language and other discursive forms are understood in, the, in relation to other forms of difference, jiving well with a concern in the anthropology of education with the discursive construction of the educated um, person. Um, Howard and Law, for instance, uh, have examined how language ideologies pertaining to respect and politeness permeate classroom expectations in ways that can impact children's school success. Similar to the ways in which scholars in anthropology of education have pointed out that students can be marginalized through their typification as, for instance, Fort, Fort Ham's uh, loud black girls or Lay's quiet Asian boys, respect and politeness can become visible practices by which social difference is noted or commented upon by teachers and fellow students alike. Howard points out that social relationships at a school have the potential to transform children's positioning within broader identity asymmetries. Children who find satisfying forms of membership and belonging within social relationships at a school are better prepared to seek multiple avenues of participation in society going beyond an untenable choice between assimilation or resistance to identity categorization. However, the discursive construction of difference within such relationships, such as when teachers perceive certain forms of classroom comportment as rude or disrespectful, may also exacerbate their marginalization. 
a theme that has figured prominently, uh, prominently in the anthropology of education for the last couple of decades is the study of immigrant and minority students uh, in relation to schooling. An important focus of this research has been educational policies, practices, and experiences that promote academic participation, inclusion, success, and enfranchisement among minority students. Elaborating on this important line of work, language socialization research has examined the politics of inclusion as it is forged in the daily social life of the school and its students' relationship. For instance, in my work, I have documented the subtle practices of exclusion and microaggressions that are a constitutive part of the relational fabric of Moroccan immigrant children's social life at a Spanish public school. In spite of the public discourse of inclusion, interculturality, and respect for diversity that constituted the school's official curriculum. Through detailed discourse analysis of the daily interactions between Moroccan immigrant children with their Spanish peers and teachers at a school, I've described the microgenesis of the social markedness and racialized exclusion as the product of everyday practice and as it is con con constructed in everyday social interaction. This is a key intersection as the importance of positive and resonant relationships with peers has emerged in the last few years as critical in educational research focusing specifically on ethnic minority and or immigrant children. The um, intersection number two bilingualism and biliteracy in relation to immigration. Um, oops, not yet. Um, in her book, Growing Up Bilingual, Anastasia Centella examined through ethnographic and detailed analysis of English and Spanish code switching practices among members of a Puerto Rican neighborhood in New York that she called El Bloque. Um, in the community, she examined the choice of language, Spanish, English, or Spanglish, revealed that locally situated norms for displaying competence, role taking, and identity formation shifted in different locations within El Bloque in response to perceptions of language use by members of the community and by those outside of the community. Um, Spanglish, well, I don't like that word, but as a linguistic practice, um, a linguistic practice as a result of the migration and language contact for Puerto Rico to the United States, the mainland, illustrated how its use was subjected to the social conventions of appropriate language use by the community. Drawing on our uh, studies of young translators and interpreter, uh, Marjorie Oriana and I have also examined parent-teacher conference where bilingual children, the ones being talked about, were um, who were also uh, present, uh, had to translate for their parents in these conferences. The narratives that the teacher constructed about their students during this conference illustrated the types of institutional uh, expectations of behavior that were expected of the children and even their parents. The discussions and, and teacher narratives in this parent-teacher conference tended to absolve teachers of problems arising in the development of the children and through their translations and picking up on these, uh, the children place the greater moral weight um, of, to become responsible for their learning on themselves. These findings underscored how the, paradox, the paradoxes of, of schools as inequitable settings for immigrant students was reproduced and constructed in a discourse genre like the parent-teacher conference, which is considered to be one of the cornerstones of school-home communication. Um, finally, uh, a group of language socialization researchers has been very active examining the ways in the discursive practices around religious texts and activities and how they serve broader goals of religious literacy and socialization and in some cases second language socialization. For instance, again, um, I told them that I would come but I would talk a lot about my work. Um, as part of uh, my ethnography of uh, Moroccan immigrant children in Spain, um, I have discussed the role of linguistic and literacy practices in the production of diaspora identity in the context of Arabic language and Quranic education. Although classical and standard Arabic is not the language of everyday interactions, it plays a significant role in the linguistic repertoires of Moroccan households for religious purposes, as well as embodying doxic representations of Moroccan national identity and authenticity. These ideologies regarding the symbolic value of the Arabic language, however, um, are embedded in contested debates of ethno-religious authenticity and continuity 
in relation to tradition and modernity among Muslims in Europe. Against this backdrop, I have examined how this internal dynamism of the Moroccan uh, immigrant community itself organizes often consistent, but sometimes ambiguous and contradictory adult socialization efforts in relation to Arabic education, especially when there are conflicting interests in achieving literacy by religious and secular elements of the children's community of, of origin. In her ethnographic studies of transnational practices of Mexican immigrants in both Chicago uh, and Michoacan, Farr identified that the doctrina educational setting or Catholic catechism for young children as serving an as important site for the processes of cultural and linguistic continuity for the immigrant community in Chicago. Patricia's, uh, Patricia Baquedano Lopez studies of doctrina classes at two parishes in California analyzed a range of literacy practices from narrative tellings of the religious icon Nuestra Señora de Guadalupe that socialized children to affiliate with an ethno-racial coll collective identity of dark-skinned Mexicans living in the United States to the interpretation of prayers, Bible stories, and parish events with moralizing messages relevant to their identities as Mexicans and as US immigrants. In addition to her work on Quranic reading practices in Cameroon, Leslie Moore is currently engaged in research with children and families of the Somali diaspora in central Ohio. In her new work, her overarching goals have been to understand how double schooling, participation in Quranic and public school shape young Somali children as learners and as users of second languages and literacies and young Somali children and their teacher and caregivers are, and how they are maintaining and transforming Quranic schooling in the diaspora here in the United, in the United States. Finally, the third intersection, um, what we are calling a holistic ethnographic perspective, um, language socialization research provides a rich, ethno, um, a rich methodological paradigm to advance important theoretical and practical concerns in the anthropology of education. We frame our triple methodological axis as follows. Long-term longitudinal ethnographic approaches and are central to capturing the experience of socialization across activities and sites. A central tenet of language socialization is its concern with understanding development and trajectories of language use, which is best analyzed across multiple uh, time scales. Multi-context, multi-sided approaches to understanding socialization afford a comparative lens to observe agency and linguistic and cultural development across sites of activities. And third, close sociolinguistic discourse analysis of educational and learning practices, including the ways in which a myriad of signs, from accent to posture to institutional labels to material arrangement of learning environments, come together in semiotic ensembles in everyday communi communicative encounters and institutional discourse both within and across events. These triple axes offer a richly layered, multi-scalar and empirically grounded view of some of common con issues of concern also to anthropologists of education, including educational ideologies and classroom practices, learning processes, and the social and linguistic stratification of students in, edu in educational spaces. Also, Another, um, another, in this sense, we think that our strong tradition in language socialization is also well positioned to contribute to emerging concerns in educational research. For instance, language socialization has richly described how literacy events become institutionalized. Also, a significant number of language socialization studies have exposed continuities and discontinuities between school uh, and home language practices, like I described earlier. More recently, however, researchers have called for identifying generative points of continuity that can be productively expanded upon in a school rather than focusing on home school dichotomies among minority children. Because it's focused on long-term, multi-context ethnography, um, we argue that language socialization research is particularly well positioned to contribute to um, those efforts. And some of the current work that I am doing involves investigating the linguistic repertoires displayed by Moroccan immigrant children in Spain in school and out of school in formal and formal learning context to identifying commonalities in discursive practices across this context. This context. Like for instance, when they are playing with their friends, when um, they are translating for their families uh, at the doctor and then 
um, in particular, um, within schools, I'm looking in particular at literacy enhancement programs, what would be akin to, uh, to ESL pullout programs here in the United States. There is, of course, overlap between language socialization research perspectives and methodologies with many who do not identify as language socialization. We acknowledge, of course, that we are not the only ones to integrate ethnographic, historical, and interactional discourse analytic approaches that have characterized different strands of anthropological studies of schooling. However, language socialization researchers often describe themselves as members of a fairly clearly defined community of practices, and there are some um, advantages to this. A concerted and relatively focused collective effort to advance our understanding of educational processes through study that takes the triple axis approach, places language and other semiotic processes at the center of our analysis, and seeks to connect these microprocesses with broader social, cultural, historical, and economic context. We can then restate that language socialization research is always expanding its focus by exploring new perspectives and bodies of related research, examining human development, learning, and socialization into, into social institutions and processes. In our generation of language socialization research, I think one clear area of growth and influence from other subfields have been our orientation towards an engagement of critical perspectives on both the linguistic and cultural dimensions uh, of educational context of learning. Thank you. Professor Thea Abu El Haj. She's currently writing a book and she's going to give us a preview of that material. The title of the talk today is Having an Identity Without a Place in the World Palestinian American Youth, Education, and the War on Terror. Uh, like other people, I'm really grateful to Leslie Bartlett and Mary Varen for hosting us. Um, I'm so pleased to be here with Fred, who set me on this journey. I, I'm a refugee. Uh, I came to anthropology of, of education from uh, educational psych from actually not educational psychology from psych a psychology program, and uh, and after a couple years in psychology, where I was really feeling that you know there's something wrong about how they're looking at how kids learn. Uh, I'd been a teacher for many years. Um, I had been fortunate to take a class from Michelle Fine before I went into this um, PhD program in psychology, and I kept running into her, and she kept saying, just get out of there, come study with me. She said, but you know, I'll introduce you to Fred, because maybe you should study with Fred. And so I ended up studying with both of them, and uh, you know, here I am, a product of this. And so also in true being a student of Fred's, um, I am not using PowerPoint, um, but I just have a little bit of data that's on paper, on actual paper that's going to go around the room that I'm going to give you a sense to uh, read on your own. Um, I always love when I see those um, CAE um, things about, uh, like listserv issues about um, qualitative research data analysis programs, and Fred keeps reminding us to use our pencils and papers, so um, there we go. Um, our plenary session has been asked to consider what we can say to our students about the vitality and continued relevance of anthropology of education, given the marginalization of our discipline and its attendant methods in the field of education, a field that I think, unfortunately, is increasingly dominated for the elusive quest for best practices, equity and excellence at scale, and by narrow conceptualizations that reduce education to schooling, teaching to methods of content delivery, and learning to measurable skills. And I would say it's precisely in this um, dismal context that our di discipline is not only relevant but essential for developing broader understandings of edu educational processes as we've been talking about today. I have a little fear this morning when Fred was talking about profits. I was uh, also thinking about Cassandra, and I'm hoping that we're not that kind of profit. Um, so um, I want to make the case for our discipline by offering a textured example, by showing and not telling, um, drawing on my own research with Palestinian American Muslim youth from a transnational immigrant community, um, to show how our disciplinary perspectives and our methods have much to offer the study of educational processes, and particularly the study um, through which young people learn to become active participants in new communities, um, especially, again, in a context where most educational policy is focused on how quickly do newcomer youth learn English as the measure of, um, you know, the end all and be all of what they're supposed to be doing here. Um, <clears throat> much of the recent research on Muslim youth 
um, from immigrant communities living in Western democracies asks how young people negotiate their religious and or their ethnic identities in relationship to their mainstream identities. And this research has, has been valuable in a contradicting popular belief that Muslims and Arab, Muslim and Arab youth and their communities are generally hostile to the countries in which they live. In fact, I was thinking it, uh, as you were talking about how, yeah, I, sometimes I would be reduced to um, the insight that these are actually human beings that we're talking about, but I'm trying to go for a little more than that. Um, but to a large extent, the dominant line of research on Muslim immigrant youth is premised on a model of immigrant acculturation that presumes that the receiving nation is the primary locus for social, cultural, and political engagement. And moreover, because much of this research relies on surveys, interviews, and focus groups, it's unable to track the everyday practices through which youth are forging a sense of social, cultural, and political belonging, both within and across the boundaries of nation states. So informed by anthropological work on modernity, globalization, citizenship, and nationalism, and conducting ethnographic research that tracks young people over time and in different contexts, I've been able to, able to open up different lines of inquiry that are not tr traditionally um, addressed in much of the literature. Although we have lots of examples here and um, in, in right now it's a very vital time with the work of people who are here and uh, my colleague Ariana Manguel Figueroa, uh, Ana Rios, um, uh, Andrea Durnas, um, Marjorie Oriana, we have a lot of folks who are doing really good work in this area. Um, our disciplinary approach allows for a deeper analysis of what can appear at first glance to represent conflicts between home and host cultures, between family and school values and expectations, and it shifts our attention instead to the way that young people are forging a sense of belonging across transnational fields, and it focuses on culture as a ter the terrain upon which larger political conflicts about belonging and citizenship are played out. The other thing I've been able to track is the ways that young people's capacity to forge a sense of belonging to the U.S. was in inextricably bound up with their encounters with everyday U.S. nationalism um, that they were uh, running into in schools and communities. So what I want to do today is tell some anecdotes. Um, as we were, we were charged with saying that our colleagues are always saying you just tell anecdotes. So I'm going to tell some anecdotes as a way to open up um, uh, our view of what, what it is we can see when we look at educational processes from this lens. Um, I, one of the things on that paper is a quote by the first, uh, by a young man I'm going to introduce to you. I'm not going to read the quote, um, but you can look through it if you want. Uh, Kamal was 19, a sophomore at a state university when I first interviewed him. Inspired by the early life of Che Guevara, Kamal aspired to become a physician and to dedicate his life to delivering medicine to Palestinians living in refugee camps. As the child of refugee status Palestinian parents, he had been fundamentally influenced by his parents' struggle to gain citizenship, and he understood well the power that his legal U.S. citizenship afforded to him and others who have it. His father had grown up as a refugee status Palestinian in Syria, his mother, Amira, had, joined, had Jordanian citizenship, but as a woman, she wasn't able to pass that on to her children. In her early 20s, Amira was fortunate enough to gain a U.S. green card, and she um, came to the U.S. to have both of her children in order to be able to pass on some state's citizenship to them. But each time, she would return to Iraq, where her husband was living, and again, as a person without any state citizenship, unable to travel. Um, as a result of this move back to Iraq, um, before this was during the sanctions, um, the war literally landed in their backyard in the form of an American bomb, and Amira and her children returned to the U.S., living here for many years until they were able to obtain a green card and their father was able to join them. Um, so this is a much more complex picture of the social incorporation of newcomers than that we usually think about with our new two years and your, uh, you know, you got to be able to speak English. Kamal's experiences were intimately bound up with unresolved conflicts that shaped the lives of Palestinian families living in the U.S. and across the world. These historic and political processes influenced the trajectory of Kamal's growing identification with the struggle for Palestinian na national self-determination. When he first returned to the U.S., he recalled crying constantly in his kindergarten because he couldn't speak English. But once he'd gained English fluency, he threw himself into being, as he told me, just another American kid. This changed in middle school because of 
Initially, he decided to hide behind the fiction that, quote, I was American, I was Spanish, whatever. Scared by experiences in his neighborhood, he told me a lot of Palestinian kids uh, talked about pretending they were Spanish for a long time. Um, um, so scared um, by these experiences he had in his no neighborhood, um, he told me, I completely understood how alienated I might be if I told people I was Arab. However, slowly as he moved on to high school, Kamal began to embrace his Palestinian identity and to speak out politically about Palestine. He had described the changes saying, I held up a flag. He began actively teaching himself by talking to his family about their experiences and learning about their expulsion from their village in 48, its destruction, what happened when they were stateless, and the work that they had done on behalf of Palestinians in Syria and Iraq. The more he learned, the more he began to, began to educate others about Palestine and to plan for a future dedicated to service on behalf of Palestinians. Kamel's commitment to the Palestinian cause occasioned some conflict with his, his sense of himself as an American. For Kamel and the other youth I've worked with, the US's close alliance with Israel and its foreign policy in the Middle East and Asia created tensions about what it means to be American. At times, he saw himself as wholly American, he would say, particularly in relation to the promises of US democratic equality, the election of an African-American president, the educational opportunities afforded by public schools and universities. These are all things he talked about, and he identified with the rights of equality that the US democracy aspires to confer on its citizens, even if it doesn't always do that. However, Kamal understood not only intellectually, but also intimately, the powerful role that the United States plays in the Middle East. Um, and as his life story unfolded across several countries and in relation to two national imaginaries, he developed a multifaceted, sometimes conflicted, conflicted sense of who he was and where he belonged, but one that led him to imagine a, rif, a rich life committed to service for peace and justice. My research then takes up this question of how Palestinian American youth carve out a sense of belonging within and across the imagined and actual landscapes of Palestine and the US. Similar to youth from many immigrant communities, these young people often spoke of struggling to figure out how they belonged in relationship to differences they talked about as being between American and Palestinian cultural practices. However, the questions about cultural belonging were far overshadowed and, in fact, inextricably interwoven with questions of political belonging raised by the Palestinian nationalist movement, the ongoing Israeli occupation of Palestine, the quest for rights of citizenship, and finally by the context of the war on terror, the U.S. war on terror. As more and more young people's lives are shaped by the processes of transnationalism and diaspora, it's critical that we understand deeply how youth construct and negotiate belonging and citizenship across multiple imagined spaces. Their everyday practices in homes, schools, and communities reflect their ongoing engagement across national imaginaries. By tracking carefully to, um, the way that young Palestinian Americans imagine and enact belonging and citizenship, I'm able to explore how these youth are reshaping the meanings and practices of citizenship and belonging in this era of globalization and mass migration. And I'd say this is really vital for informing educational policies for newcomers. Um, but at the same time, the other move I'm trying to make in my work is documenting how um, their, their uh, ability to, to belong and to be educated was deeply impacted by um, the encounters they had with normative discourses of American liberal nationalism um, that are expressed and produced in everyday practices and that positioned them as impossible subjects of this national imaginary. These normative discourses circulate in the public domain, but they're also expressed in everyday practice, um, and they structured how educators spoke about and interacted with the Palestinian American youth in their schools, and they also helped structure the educational pathways and opportunities for these young people. It's way beyond the scope of what I can do uh, today in the time and also at the time of day, uh, to talk about what liberal nationalism is in detail, but um, briefly, um, liberal nationalism is defined as nationalism that draws on liberal values such as freedom, individual rights, equality, and tolerance, values that are presumed to be universal, um, and that in the, the, there's some interesting literature um, or, that tracks the ways that the U.S. national imaginary over the last 50 years has really um, put in the midst of its core this idea that we're multicultural and diverse, and so I look a lot at uh, the role of multiculturalism and multicultural discourses in producing um, 
this U.S. national imaginary. The norms of liberal um, nationalism, the norms that define what America stands for, um, have not been created in a vacuum. They simultaneously create self and other, insider and outsider, and, um, and, and they function under a conceit of neutrality and universality. So it makes it seem like, you know, we're all being, when there's a lot of talk in the school about um, us being a nice place, right, for people to kind of be welcomed into our community. Um, but they create, even as they hide, a set of norms that function um, to exclude those people who are presumed to be incapable of participating in, um, in, the, in the kind of ways and values set out by liberal nationalism, and, and we know who those people are. Um, liberal nationalism is hinged to the, the U.S.'s contemporary imperial project, justifying its role on the global stage and discursively framing an oppositional relationship between Americans Mus and Muslims and Arabs and other folks who are uh, included in that category. And actually, um, the, the hardest work I've had to get into journals has been the stuff which has called U.S. nationalism and sort of colonialism and imperialism to task. That's the stuff that, you know, people said, that's not research. She's not doing research, right? <laughs> it's okay, I did eventually get published. But, um, ethnography allows me to track expressions of liberal nationalism and its devolution into more explicitly racist forms in actual practice and to analyze the effects of its everyday expression on the lives and education of the youth with whom I worked. So um, I'm going to tell you one other anecdote to illustrate this. Um, uh, there's a young woman, Samira, I, I call her Samira. I met her in her sophomore year in high school. And when I first met her, she didn't, um, she w w didn't cover her hair, but then she spent a summer um, uh, in another city, and she attended religious school, and she made the decision to start wearing a hijab. And in her, um, I tell you this because she tells the story um, to me the following year where she and a group of her peers who were also, also had their hair, heads covered got into a confrontation with a the teacher. They were, one of the girls was eating in a classroom and he called them a pig and they confronted him. Um, and he finally says, um, so they confronted him about calling them a pig. And um, he says, she starts yelling at this one friend saying, I know how men in your country treat you. I've been to your country twice already. If you talk to your family member like that, he would smack you across the face. And she reports, I said, this is our country. What country did you visit? In the face of this challenge to both the rules of the classroom and this teacher's authority, his reactive response was immediately to frame these girls as outsiders who belong to another country. Um, actually, the girls in this group were mostly um, girls. I think this was a, girl, a group of girls who had mostly grown up here. A lot of the youth I work with were born here but spent most of their childhood and early adolescence in Palestine and then came back. Um, but just as importantly, the boundary he constructs between the U.S. and your country turned on certain assumptions about the oppression of Muslim women. Um, in signaling the way men treat you in your country violently by smacking you across the face, the teacher implicitly was contrasting the putative oppression um, of Muslim women with an assumption of equality and freedom defining life of um, women in the United States. Um, now, this story alone you could just, you could tell me that was simply an anecdote, but in fact, and, and an example of teachers' re reactive racism against Muslims, but what I'm able to show through anthropological work that connects larger, local to larger sociocultural processes and utilizes the situated perspectives of ethnography is, are the ways that his words reverberated with broader discourses of liberal nationalism that were expressed repeatedly at the school that youth, these youth were in. Teachers and administrators constantly told the story about the school and the nation as spaces of a liberal national imaginary in which each person is treated as an equal, each person's culture is respected, and tolerance is the reigning value. And as they did so, they typically positioned Palestinians and other Muslims, um, not all Palestinians are Muslims, but in this community they were, as illiberal subjects of other places who were in need of liberation from or discipline for the illiberal tendencies of their communities and the places that they came from. So what I, in making visible the everyday processes of contemporary nation formation through which this oppositional relationship is both expressed and produced between Americanness and Arab or Muslim otherness, we're able to deepen our understanding of processes of racialization in schools and in society 
which have been and continue to be not only about racial domination and subordination inside the boundaries of this nation, but just as importantly, inextricably interwoven with global racial formations and with the United States' role as an imperial power. Um, if, if we're to understand the ways that young Palestinian Americans were typically positioned as impossible subjects of this nation, we have to understand better that the United States' national imaginary remains a colonial imaginary, and we must also pay close attention to the everyday effects of this reality. The relate, this is a relationship that's under-examined in most of the literature on contemporary U.S. education, um, which tends to ask, again, how immigrant youth get dragged into the existing racialized hierarchy of the U.S. without careful attention to the ways that the norms defining what it means to be American and thereby by where you go into this racial hierarchy are tied to norms of liberal nationalism that is at its heart also an expression of a colonial imaginary. It's anthropology and its attendant methods that allow me to scrutinize how these normative discourses of nationalism were manifest in everyday practices and shaped the ways that educators understood and interacted with their young Palestinian American students, informing also how these young people developed their own sense of belonging and citizenship to this and other national imaginaries and structuring their opportunity, their educational opportunities and their trajectories. Um, so I'm not really sure how we make all this translate, how we do that fancy interpretive translation, but I know that we really can't understand the education of young people um, without um, somehow getting into this much larger uh, field that I think man so many of us are in. Um, and I'm going to stop there. Thank you. Respond to this, this idea. I mean, I take seriously. We've talked about this a lot about this notion of culture is what's here and, and what we make of it and unmake of it. And the problem that I have in trying to understand things falling apart, and yes, someone pointing it out that it's falling apart, because the pointing out is actually, I don't want to get postmodern here because, and the, the, the pointing it out is part of what is, but it's also part of the reconstruction already. Right, so the simultaneously things of going on of um, deconstructing and reconstructing aren't separate, right? But I'm not in a place where I know how to talk about the falling apart without extracting it because I think it's it's been ignored for so long. But I agree with you that it needs to. I need to come. I think it's all making culture, but I need to come a way of talking about it in ways that are more nuanced so it doesn't seem like this separate thing. So I'm very uh, nascent in this kind of thinking which comes out of the productive playing with the edges of policy. So I kind of moved from the productive play of, of the edges of policy that we worked on to the total collapse, right? And so I'm still thinking this. Uh, to, 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 um, you have, in a sense, to accept possibly the very ideologies that you're actually, that are implicit in the critique. Mm -hmm. 
So there is a way in which when you point that something is wrong or falling apart, there is a point of view for which it is falling apart, because from another point of view, it's just t totally okay. <laughs> the point of view that is for falling apart, which we all kind of agree uh, within ourselves, has a broader context, and that's when we enter this broader context, which are not simply the policy makers, sort of the detailed bureaucrats <laughs> of the policy makers, but the ones beyond. And I, I would say we have to get to, also to get to talk to both Arnie Duncan and to Bill Gates. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Let's put those two together in a room. We get it done away. Um, do oh. any of you? Know? Yeah. Oh, well, I don't think I need. I don't think I need these, right? Can you? Yes, you do. Oh, oh I sorry. Do. Oh, sorry. Okay, I do. I do. These things scare me a little. I don't know why. But um, I, I just wanted to say very quickly, t um, to follow that comment up, is that it's there is an aspect also about things, you know, things being done wrong or things falling apart that I think I, we absolutely have to be in the business of documenting, which is the aspect of making things visible that may not be readily apparent. And, um, you know, I, I totally agree with Thea that, you know, the people are not paying attention to how children and youth themselves are positioning. Um, that's, you know, one thing that you, we should be in the business of documenting. But it's also, for instance, in my own work, um, what I find is that people are, when, people are very good at identifying ideologies that are found in fringe discourse, right? But when you go as, and say, you know, you have this really benign program that promotes diversity and, <laughs> you know, in effect what you're doing is um, reproducing almost the same kind of nativist nationalism that those fringe um, discourses and, you know, like, neo-Nazi groups basically are, um, you know, th those things are not visible for people. And it's, you know, so those are, that's an aspect also of things not being done right or things falling apart. Sorry. The phone told me you had to do that. So. Okay, for him. I'm going to do it. <laughs> Not for you. So, um, I'm, a, I'm a horrible army person. Um, so I also work with refugees, many of them from Iraq, Somali. Um, I, I think on a personal level, so uh, to make myself feel good, uh, maybe not necessarily to make a difference in their lives, I volunteer to do something else. So I. I volunteer to teach ESL, and uh, I'm a tutor for their citizenship class. So that's for, that's for me to feel better. That they may or may not actually help their bigger um, 
the social conditions, but that, that, that makes it better. Um, I also drink, which, <laughs> uh, and if, I'm gonna if be honest, it, it's, it's a very, um, it, we're here to be honest, it's the end of the day, there's a lot, of, it, you know, you get, I, I go to the gym, I work out like a fiend, I, I, there's so those personal kind of things. But I think, even in talking about things falling apart, I'm not seeing them in a negative aspect. I'm still um, in the see what we do and see what we make together. And the we includes them. So even in, in, in telling those tragedies, those horrors, in, in those things, and not to put it as res, you know, even resilience, or to see what we're making, what we're doing together now, and what they're doing. So I've been looking at social mobility and entrepreneurship of women um, from Sub-Saharan Africa, from Iraq, and this is exciting stuff to me. Right, they're starting businesses. And so they have to offset that because we have to tell the whole story. Right, that's another issue. To tell one part of it is in also being true to our holistic um, route. So you have to do some stuff for yourself so that you feel better, whatever that is for you. Uh, and then just, I feel, be true to, to what their lives are and can become. It's, it's still hard, I think it's still hard. I would just add that, I mean, I've thought about this question a lot, too. Not, not in terms of, like, how can I handle doing work on the Middle East any longer, but, um, <laughs> but also the humanizing, yeah, but also the humanizing piece, because I think we're, we're pushed to talk about the more serious issues, and we're pushed to respond, and we're pushed to talk about what's going on in Syria, or talk about women in Saudi Arabia, or, but I do think, I mean, I, as a, as a researcher who does work in the Arab world, I do feel like and I've sort of failed at this thus far, I have a responsibility of talking about people's normal lives and what makes them happy. And, and I have this little, but one of my favorite chapters, but the hardest to write in my book, is like these images of girls in the schoolyard romanticizing about fantasy boyfriends. And, and I put that in not knowing exactly what to do with it, but just because I thought, here they just look like teenage girls, you know, and they're just laughing. And I tried to even capture this image of them with their hands on each other's shoulders and giggling in the schoolyard. So I think we need to do more of that, but I think the problem is, is that sort of the, what we're pushed, and even academically what we're pushed to talk about, and, it, and there's this regional dimension of it too, right? So you write a book about you know, fun in the Arab world, and people are like, what's that any use for, you know? <laughs> you know? And I have to say, one of the best conferences I participated in was Love and Romance in the Arab World. I got invited to this conference because I started doing work on marriage. I was like, yes, you know, for once I'm going to go talk about other things. But of course, it was lots of tragedy still, because love is always tragedy, right, everywhere. But um, no, but I think it's important. So I think, you know, part of it is how we deal with our work, but also it's part of the humanizing is not always talking about things falling apart. But that's difficult. I think it's difficult, because I think we're, the imperative is to kind of explain why they're falling apart, or explain that they're not really falling apart, but think, you know, this. We could also ask Fida how she got invited to a love and romance conference if she was working on marriage, but we'll let that pass. But yeah. So, I mean, Sally knows this, and she does a lot of good work with the community she's in. But, um, but it's not about good work. I mean, I think this is back to how we find multiple um, ways to do our work. So, um, you know, it's the question of, like, you know, partly it's what's our audience, but also in the work... Uh, that I was do, that I've been doing or had been doing for so long. Um, I did a lot of um, work with youth uh, to do um, video, like to to do art and video production with them, sort of supporting them to speak back to what they were facing, um, especially in the you know immediate aftermath of 9/11. Um, and that's not. I mean, sometimes I joke. I'm like the left is doing participatory action research with youth, and the right is like organizing, getting on city councils and you know, working their way up into the, the Congress, which is true to some extent. So, I mean, I, in part, I, I say that to say we need these, I think, these multiple layers of, of engagement and critique. I'm not totally ready to throw the academy out of the water. Um, but, but I do think that, you know, there's lots of places that we're trying to do work. And I think a lot about Miles Horton uh, talking about creating islands of de decency. And I sort of hold on to that image of, you know, it, it's a sea of despair, but we got to create these little, these little spaces that hopefully, well after I'm dead, will maybe create some broader bridges and stuff. But we got to find a lot of ways to work. 
Yeah, I just wanted to make, make um, one more comment about this and, you know, the, the human as aspect and humanizing um, the people we um, work with. And um, one of the things that I'm going to tell you about my favorite thing about my work and what I do. And as part of my work, yes, I describe a lot of obstacles that immigrant children encounter and it's, it's part of doing justice to their experience to describe that. But because I follow them around all the time in many different contexts of their lives, my favorite part of my own research is when I get to write about and talk about how incredibly sophisticated and smart um, the children are. And when I get to show people all the skills they have and all they can do and how well they can do it, and sometimes how dumb we are to think that children are not picking up and acting on things that they're actually, you know. So, just. Thank you, Emma. We have just about five minutes left, so I'm gonna sort of sweep the room. I know there was a question here. And then shall, anybody else? Shall we end with Fred? Okay, we'll start. Here. I mean, one just basic thing is, you know, whenever students ask me, well, how do Arab women, I say, which Arab women, where, when, I mean, so just, be, I mean, I just won't respond to questions like that. So I don't know, I mean, and so my work is to, is to try to say that, and I, I mean, I know that doesn't sound like much of an answer, but that's what I think is most, one of the most important pedagogical goals I have, <laughs> is to convey that sentiment. I was in a, I spent a lot of the summer in a tiny town in Vermont, and uh, this summer I was, um, I went to the local church service one uh, Sunday morning, it's like a little community gathering, and this guy, um, one of my neighbors comes up and he says to me, so um, you're probably the person I know who can speak best to this, um, you know, because <laughs> I have a Muslim family, and I should have known that what was coming, and he said, so what were those two men in Bo at the Boston Marathon thinking? Oh <laughs> and after some silence, I was like, I have no idea. I said, I often wonder, like, you know, about all kinds of violence. I said, what do you think Timothy McVeigh was thinking? Um, but, you know, I think it's exactly that, like a refusal to respond. But I also think there's a very practical issue in schools which is, and this is where the multicultural fairs and, you know, like the, the school that I worked in, the, the kind of, there's no way to, to sort of get beyond the, we, we, we're a United Nations, everyone gets along. Of course, if they really went to the UN, they would know that that was a bad <laughs> metaphor for everyone getting along. But I, I, I think we really have to break down the, I mean, I think we just have to do, do away with like the multicultural fairs and the, you know, this, in some way, and also how do we get, if, if the teachers had just talked to the kids, they would have exactly found out that there was a range of 
you know, a range of Arabs in the schools, a range of Palestinians, a range of experiences, but how do we build that into, and, and then in the, in the environment we're in, how do we create time for teachers to do that? Um, so I think those are the ways that it's very practical on the ground stuff so that it's not this, you know, what do Arab women do? Yeah. Yeah. Or, yeah. Professor Erickson, we turn to you. I think about Things Fall Apart, I'm reminded that that's the title of the, uh, uh, the Nigerian novelists, the most distinguished uh, Nigerian novelist uh, of our lifetime, his first book. And, uh, um, and then that reminds me about colonialism and much of what uh, we've heard, uh, I realize, for the two days has something to do with that. And there's a colonialism beyond that of American and French. Um, uh, there's a colonialism of, of uh, the professional education world uh, and it's adult centrism. I mean, the, what's so so vicious about colonialism is uh, the belief by those in power that what they're doing with the colonized is in the best interest of the colonized. And so from preschool education to elementary school to high school to looking at uh, uh, college, uh, provision of education. Professional educators get trapped in that sense of we're only doing this for your own good. Uh, and that's an awful thing to be caught in. Um, and I'm going to go back and reread a couple of things about colonialism that were current when I was a graduate student almost 50 years ago. Um, France Fanon on Algeria uh, and the madness of French colonialism that he, that he uncovered. And uh, there was another one, uh, he was an Italian, Alberto Memmi, Prospero and Caliban. I think we have to go back and think seriously, anybody who lives in the United States needs to take seriously both the adultocentric colonialism of so much of the way we live in our relationship with young people and uh, of how the, the United States um, relates to the rest of the world. And anthropology of education has something to say about that. Thank you. So, oh, I'm sorry, Laura. One last question or comment. One last question. Uh, in light of speaking about colonial, colonialism, we could, uh, in this response also to my own bias and my interest in teachers, what can anthropology do to decolonize teacher education? So we've ended here with some provocative <laughs> challenges, I think. Um, if I, do, does anyone want to say anything before I come up? Do you? No? No, no one wants to respond to Laura? The teacher. <laughs> I think in, when we talk about the decolonialization of teacher education, we also have to look at the history and the feminization of it. So I think there's uh, multiple intersecting issues that need to be attended to. I do think that's where anthropology has a great deal to say, although it is more programs are getting shorter 
and the certification programs for teachers and educators can be, be quite short now. Um, less and less classes are offered that would allow anthropologists to teach in those classes or sociologists or philosophers that I believe would help with the curricular part of it. That still doesn't help in the access, the selection, the placement, right, in, te in teacher education. But I do believe that there's a curricular challenge that we are not meeting the demographic changes of the population across the board, K through 20, but also in teacher education. Um, Can I say a mini thing? Yeah. Um, so I, I um, co-direct a tiny uh, um, teacher education program for our students at Rutgers who want to um, teach in urban schools. And um, the, it's 18 month residency, they do a lot of different things. But in their last semester after they've student taught, we send them back to the schools they student taught in, and they run an after school program um, teaching youth how to do uh, participatory action research. And the thing is that they think that we set this up so that they would do service in the schools, which is really not what we did. Um, we, and we, I structure some, uh, some assignments, but really the goal is for our students to learn what youth can know and can do. And, I, and they don't understand that when they go in, that we're really trying to kind of, th this is really f about their learning. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's wonderful we do these things and the kids have been coming back for years and all that, but really it's about our teacher ed students because they don't learn about kids' competencies um, anywhere else uh, or, you know, for the most part. And that we have to create more opportunities, I think, for our students to, to know what kids can do. So in two days, we've moved from uh, Ed Gordon and Fred Erickson, two ordained ministers, to <laughs> Jill at the podium. <laughs> we moved from the, the history of anthropology of education through the really rich ways in which all our presenters and each of you are making the field as through your work. We certainly appreciate your time and your energy and attention, and we wish you well as you move out and continue this work in your own lives and institutions. Thank you all very much.